All right, well, I want to welcome everyone to Embodied Carbon and the Passive House Standard. This course is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Today, I'll be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I am the program manager here. Uh, real quick, just so you know, this course is approved for multiple continuing education units, um, including a uh, certified green home professional under the, uh, ma the materials pathway of the five pillars of green and AIA health, welfare and safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. And then also we're approved for um, the Passive House Institute. So thank you for that, Ken. Um, before we get started, we just got to give a shout out to one of our founding members, uh, Bazani uh, Company. They, I just got to hand them an award. They have a leader, leadership award from the United States Green Building Council for achieving uh, the UN uh, zero carbon standards for uh, their Bradford Station uh, project. And I was so excited to be able to hand them uh, Michigan's first ever Green Star certified multifamily project along with it. These are really cool apartments that you can go in and tour on their website right now and you can see how it's designed you can see the mini split see how they're really doing the right thing going all electric and achieving these goals so i was super excited to hand that award off to um, peter their new ceo over at bazani construction company and this is what green home institute members are doing this is what you can do we're going to send you a free mug sign up to become a member you can do these amazing things and you can become and you know you get instant access to all of our webinars so you don't have to keep signing up uh, before we get started, a huge thanks to our top tier sponsor, AWARE. This device tracks five key indoor air quality metrics in real time down to five minute intervals and will communicate when those issues arise and the severity of them. You're going to be tracking PM 2.5, which can come from cooking, traffic. I can tell you personally, this summer, wildfire smoke was pouring in from California into my window. I had no idea. This told me it was coming in. I shut the window. That helped a lot. My neighbor was burning something. It was coming in real nasty stuff. I wouldn't have known if I hadn't had this. Uh, it also tracks TVOC, total volatile organic compounds. Those can come from anywhere. I learned about which candles I should be using and which ones I shouldn't because it was detecting poorer air quality in the one versus the other. Um, carbon dioxide, believe it or not, yes, we all breathe it out, but too much of it makes you sleepy, angry, and also makes it hard to sleep. So you wanna track that with this device. Humidity is important. What's going on with our air dew point uh, is important to know about. So it tracks that as well as temperature. And you might say, oh, I already have a thermostat, but hey, I have it set on the other side of my house and it's telling me it's a lot colder on the other side of the house away from the thermostat. It's great information. It gives you details across the day so you can see what the heck is going on at the day level, what's going on with chemicals. You can see this is a snapshot of my own uh, uh, phone here. Uh, here at the top, you can see this gives me data on TVOCs across the week. What's going on? It gives you that information, gives you the total score uh, as well to tell you uh, how healthy your home is. And they have the Omni, which is more for businesses, or you can use it um, in the place uh, along with CO2, uh, uh, carbon monoxide, and smoke detectors. That's, that's where we're headed, right? That's the direction we're headed into. And it's got the noise and light detection as well. So you can check them out over at getaware.com. They're reset standard certified. We're challenging all builders and HVAC contractors to give these to your clients and prove your projects are truly healthy. And before we head out, a uh, big thanks to our second sponsor, Ava Window. You've got uh, up to R7. It's gonna help with passive house. It's gonna help with uh, better window performance. Uh, UPVC and even aluminum if you wanna get some recycled content, maybe lower embodied energy something we might be talking about here a little bit later. Um, so I am super excited to have Ken Levinson back on the show. I'm gonna hand it off to him now with the Passive House Alliance. I'm really excited about this topic. We had uh, Stacy um, on from LT3C last year talking about some tools really more at the corporate setting. This is the way we gotta go uh, for the residential housing construction setting. So I'm, I'm just really excited about this. We got, this is a huge issue we gotta tackle. Ken's going to tell you more about it, and I'm going to hand it off to you now, Ken. So please do take it away. Great. Thank you, Brett. Um, let's see here. Boom, boom. All right. Thank you again, Brett, uh, for having me. Great to be here. Uh, hello, everybody. 
My name is Ken Levinson. I am the executive director of the Passive House Network. And just a line or two about myself. I'm an architect by training and education. I practiced architecture for several decades and uh, became obsessed with climate change, discovered Passive House Online back in 2009, and was just like, this is it. This is what's going to, uh, to, to deliver building, building industry to effectively deal with the climate crisis, uh, acting at, proportionately to the emergency. I was very fortunate in being able to have a few clients early take on Passive House projects. I'm in Brooklyn, New York, and we did some early retrofits of townhouses in historic Brooklyn neighborhoods. Um, and from that, discovered that, you know, there's a lot of knowledge and, and materials, components that were missing. So we set out, uh, myself and, and a couple of others, uh, to co-found 475 High Performance Building Supply um, to bring those components and, and knowledge sharing uh, to uh, the American market. Um, and at the same time helped co-found New York Passive House. And what was then the American Passive House Network became the North American Passive House Network and is now the Passive House Network. Uh, the Passive House, as, as small as the Passive House market still is, it is quite confusing and I'll readily admit that and hopefully uh, and happy to answer any questions that you may have um, in any regard to Passive House. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about our organization. Oh, and I think I'm going to say Brett has some polls, perhaps, um, to give us a sense. I was very excited to see people from all over the world here and different backgrounds. And um, uh, yeah, that poll's launching right now. So, okay, great. Take one. I'm gonna move my back. windows around here. Um, so this will be great feedback to have. Uh, please put your questions in the chat. I'm happy to hang out and discuss and answer all questions, but I will go through the material just so we, we know we get through it um, uh, in a fairly expeditious way. So the Passive House Network is a national nonprofit. We're really focused on the US market. We're affiliated with the Passive House Institute in Darmstadt, Germany, and the International Passive House Association. And we work with Passive House groups all around the world. So I saw someone from Australia. There's a great uh, Passive House Australia organization, one in New Zealand, uh, Passive House Trust in the UK, um, as, as well as many, many countries in Latin America, uh, across Europe, of course, China. So uh, we're also very uh, involved in the North American Certifiers Circle may not realize, but there are over 20 individuals uh, who are capable of certifying to the Passive House standard uh, for the United States market are active. Uh, there are many more that are qualified, but 20 that are active and 13 organizations and a critical component to the knowledge sharing and institutional knowledge building of this community. They're a great resource. The Passive House Network is, is fundamentally an education and training organization, a sharing, knowledge sharing organization, connecting people uh, and, and sharing experiences. We're happy to work with the Building Energy Exchange on a wide range of introductory courses that are accessible online, of course. Um, and then we have the core certification courses around uh, the International Passive House Standard, the Certified Passive House Designer slash Consultant. Um, and the tradesperson course. And then advanced courses, depending on what you're doing, specifically within the industry. Uh, and then the building certification process, to go back to the certifications again, we really see as fundamental as part of this ongoing education. When you're doing those initial buildings in particular, certification is a gift. Don't look at it as a, a burden. You are going to learn so much and you're gonna learn from the certifiers and others and learn from others' mistakes um, and, and bake that institutional knowledge into what you're doing. We'll talk about the, that a little bit with the Passive House Standard. So I encourage everybody, wherever you are in your Passive House pathway, to check out the resources that we have and the educational offerings. Um, the designer course 
is the core course in terms of uh, passive house knowledge. And if you're a professional in the industry, definitely encourage you to check that out. We have a conference, a national conference happening in Boston uh, and online this June, June 10th and 17th. Uh, it will be uh, really focused on these four major issues, uh, efficiency, electrification, embodied carbon, and equity. And one of the things we'll talk about here is how Passive House really supports a wide range of sustainability goals um, and, and intersects with uh, many aspects of the crises that we're, we're facing today. So if you're in New England, please come, come by the conference or anywhere around the world, uh, you'll be able to access the conference. It should be excellent. All right, so let's dive in. I wanna give, basically with this talk, give a bit of an overview of, of Passive House um, and some aspects. If you know Passive House fairly well, hopefully there will be some bits of new information or new ways of thinking about it um, that you can take away from this. And then how the embodied carbon is relating to that, this new tool that we've launched, uh, uh, pH Ribbon, and, and what we're doing with that and how you may be able to utilize that uh, to really calculate complete uh, carbon emissions of your building. So, Important thing with Passive House is to know that it starts not with energy efficiency, but it starts with the occupants. It's about occupant comfort and occupant health. And these two aspects drive performance. And this is really the founding uh, principle that sets, that sets it apart, at least in terms of its uh, worldview, if you will. It's basic building science. There's no magic here. It's not reinventing the wheel but it's rigorously looking things through this lens. Uh, the definition, I would like to say the platonic or sort of idealized definition of Passive House is that it's a building for which thermal comfort can be achieved solely by post heating or post cooling of the fresh air mass, which is required to achieve sufficient indoor air quality conditions without the need for additional recirculation of air. Now that is a mouthful. Um, but to unpack that briefly, because it is important in terms of how things shift, what we're talking about is thermal comfort and indoor air quality being drivers of performance, as we noted. Um, now, we're doing this without any recirculation of air. So we're doing 100% exhaust and 100% supply, and we're doing just enough to maintain high indoor air quality sufficient indoor air quality. So uh, it's continuous ventilation to maintain that, but it's also at a relatively low volume. And now we have a low volume of air that needs to deliver, theoretically at least, the heating and the cooling uh, to the space. And so what we're talking about is a very low energy state. Really efficiency is driving the ability to provide comfort and health. So we're talking about driving down the energy demand, maximizing the efficiency, and that providing all of these comfort and health benefits that are the goal. So it's taking things, essentially what, how I would put it is, it's taking things that are seemingly in contradiction. We think of efficiency as, uh, as a burden, as a sacrifice, as something that's going to make us more uncomfortable that's going to make us unhealthy, uh, that we have to give something up. And really what we're saying is efficiency is what's going to ensure your comfort and health. You're not giving it up. It's actually supporting it. So we have with Passive House, uh, low energy state, um, looking at this diagram and looking at the energy balance. So the energy is the tool that's gonna help us deliver the health and comfort. And so here we have uh, a diagram with heating losses uh, below the line and heat, and heat gains above the zero line. This is shown for a house. It could be any type of building. This is shown for heating dominated uh, climate. It could be in a cooling dominated climate. Um, that doesn't really matter. What we wanna see here is the magnitude. Um, so in a old leaky house, we have 
lots of heat losses through the enclosure, and we need to make up those losses with a big heating system. We have some solar gain, we have some internal gains. Um, with a more modern house, it's going to be better, uh, but not nearly what it needs to be. Um, that we hope it's better. In a passive house, we are really crushing that down to maximize as much as possible uh, the efficiencies that we can inherently get in the passive elements of the building. We're talking about insulation, air tightness, heat recovery, passive heat recovery. Um, and by doing this, uh, by really focusing on, on this energy balance, we're talking about up to a 90% reduction in heating and cooling energy use, uh, up to over uh, up to about a 75% reduction in overall energy use. And that 90% reduction in, in heating and cooling energy use can then translate into about a 75% reduction in heating and cooling systems uh, sizing. So much smaller systems. It's dramatic. The mechanical engineers need to be convinced. You need to talk to them a few times uh, and run through it. And it's really important why the building needs to be built to the specifications so that you can optimize the systems and get that savings out of the systems. Everything works together. We'll talk about that more in a second. So we're squashing this down. Um, and in related to, it's always more complicated, right? But passive house is, is elegant in its simplicity and one of the things that's really compelling to it. And so with the passive house, basic passive house criteria, you have the heating demand of 4.75 kilobtus per square foot per year. You also have a heating load alternative criteria here, but this 4.75 is really the driver. You have a cooling with a dehumidification uh, uh, contribution, which can vary based on climate, and you have a air tightness test, um, uh, which is extremely airtight. And then you have a uh, primary energy, this is primary energy renewable, it's not directly um, transferable, but it's a dramatically lower, is that up to 75% reduction in overall energy usage. We want to make sure that we're, we're cutting across the board. And then the, the, these um, criteria are translated into these different standards. So we have the, the classic passive house, and then we have a slightly higher performance building with integrated renewables at plus, and then further at premium. And what it's doing is pushing towards electrification. It's pushing towards renewable integration, but the goal is never within this passive house context, net zero, uh, it's about optimized systems. We'll get net zero from one place or another. Uh, it could be on the building, but it doesn't necessarily need to be on the building. And these standards are also uh, then extended to retrofits. And there's a whole enterfit standard that also has this kind of ladder of classic plus premium. Um, and we're seeing uh, from very historic buildings uh, all the way up to, you know, buildings that are much too young, but still need to be retrofitted uh, to passive house standards and, and a lot of activity around that. So if you're dealing with a retrofit, uh, don't think it can't be passive house. It certainly can be and should be most likely. Um, and so with these few numbers, with this basic approach to performance, which is just, is incredibly reductive, right? Uh, it's just um, really focusing on the, these couple of levers. What we wanna drive is the, the predictability um, for the optimization. And so this is one of, of, of many examples from the Philadelphia affordable housing. Um, and what we see is, and as one could imagine, a typical code building, the performance can be all over the place. You have a great building or a really terrible building. Um, you're just not going to have in the normal constraints any sense of predictability. So the mechanical engineers are gonna oversize everything um, and use the rules of thumb and all of that. Uh, lead is super important, has been great in terms of the transformation of the market, can, uh, has, um, does many important things in terms of sustainability. Unfortunately, the predictability of the energy usage 
is not one of its strong suits. And you can have a great variation uh, in performance. And again, so you have this oversizing and, and far too often because of the of overglazing and, and not dealing with thermal bridges and, and other aspects, you can have lead buildings using more energy, which is really unfortunate uh, because it's doing so many good things, but then loses the battle on the energy usage. In passive house, you're still gonna have variation. You're always gonna have variation. At the end of the day, uh, buildings are perhaps far too custom uh, built, uh, particularly in the United States at this day and age. Um, and you have a wide range of usage. Uh, folks who like it cold, folks who like it hot, folks who are really focused on it and are like actively trying to drive down the energy use and folks who don't wanna think about it at all. And that will give you a variation, but what we wanna do is see that variation really narrow in bandwidth. And that's what we see with this admittedly limited uh, selection in this one graph. Uh, a narrower band, but this is the basic concept across the across the the, the uh, industry and the approach. And so we have this basic uh, philosophy approach um, and these uh, simple metrics to go towards it. And with that, we have this fundamental methodology around basic building science. And again not reinventing the wheel. Passive House was built on decades of uh, work and research. You can go back to Southern China, vernacular Southern China, which actually is directly related to the first modern Passive House in Darmstadt, Germany. Uh, you can look at the work in Scandinavia, in Germany, in Austria, in the United States, and in Canada, all building on each other uh, to where the Passive House Institute uh, sort of brought it into the current, the current age. Um, we boil it down here and oversimplify uh, to five basic principles. One, a sufficient insulation. That's gonna be highly climate variable, um, uh, but it's going to often be more than you typically would have. There are occasions where you could actually do less insulation than code, and I've been involved in projects where that's the case um, because of the overall optimization, uh, but typically you're gonna have substantially more insulation than typical. Um, and that insulation has to be absolutely continuous. Think of it as a thermos. Um, it's not a very attractive analogy, but functionally it's quite good. Uh, in terms of that continuity of insulation. And that means eliminating thermal bridges. Thermal bridges are discontinuity in, the, in that insulating layer. So metal window frames or where walls hit floors or, or walls hit roofs, um, balconies, protrusions, structural elements. You have all sorts of things that are working to degrade the performance of the enclosure. And we want to rigorously eliminate them, uh, minimize them, and, and, and calculate them uh, so that we have as predictable an enclosure as possible. The lack of dealing with thermal bridges is another reason for the oversizing of equipment and uh, lack of performance. Uh, so uh, with that, we have air tightness, continuous air tightness, really, probably the single most important driver of building performance. Um, I could go on and on about air tightness, but we'll leave it there for the moment. It sets the table for great indoor air quality at the end of the day, as well as energy savings. The windows and doors, uh, of course, in most places they're triple pane. They don't always have to be, they need to be thermally broken, triple gasketed often, airtight, Think of them as extensions of the insulation and air tightness layers, that continuity and the installation of them are incredibly important. And we need to think about solar protection, that the windows, yeah, we're getting free heating from them in the winter. Uh, these are not passive solar buildings. These are not overly glazed buildings. We need to keep the glazing in terms of solar exposure in balance. If you've got a lot of glazing and you have the threat of solar exposure, you need protection. Um, and the best protection is exterior, either landscape, architectural elements, um, and then interior. And this is one of the things that, uh, you know, we really need to uh, um, 
be more uh, clear and insistent on with American practitioners in general. There's a long history of um, solar protection around the world in dealing with this, particularly in hot climates. So in, in the south uh, of the US, they're, they're more used to it. But in our modern construction, you know, we build the same building everywhere, right? We don't do solar protection the way we would have done historically. Passive House, ironically, brings back some of that historic, brings back some of that vernacular approach. And then we have the heat recovery ventilation. We have control of that interior environment. We're gonna ventilate continuous uh, low flow, 100% fresh air to the serve spaces, the bedrooms, the living rooms, the offices, the classrooms, what the theaters, whatever it might be, and exhausting from the serve spaces, the service spaces, the, the bathrooms, the kitchens, the utility rooms, the hallways. And we're going to have a passive heat recovery element in that highly efficient fan. You know, all our buildings have fans and pulling, just typically it's intermittent. We don't have control over it. This we have control. We have 90% heat recovery or, or greater typically now. Um, and so even in, in cold weather, hot weather, we can bring in that air within a couple of degrees of the, the space and you, you feel comfortable. We don't, we can minimize the need to preheat or cool. So boiled down, all of that stuff goes into the PHPP, which we'll come back to in a second with the embodied carbon. Um, a great tool because it's fully transparent. You can see all the calculations. You can use it as a design tool and use it as variants. You can run future climate scenarios. Um, you can change all kinds of variables depending on how you think the building is going to ultimately be used or change from different uses and stress test it. Um, you can optimize in terms of construction, in terms of the specifications uh, and what's done. We'll talk about the embodied carbon in a second here. Passive house should not cost that much more. It's higher quality construction, but the fundamentals, this graph here shows that the average passive house in this grouping of, again, in Pennsylvania, affordable housing actually costs on average less than typical conventional building. We're not going to pitch it as being costing less, just to say that there are many factors driving costs in construction. Passive house is not the primary driver of construction costs. Uh, too often, any cost issue, any problem that happens on the job site all gets hung, thrown onto passive house because it's the new kid on the block. Um, you know, typically when you dig down, uh, there are issues that are all too common in construction and really have nothing to do with passive house. So the trick to making passive house costs effective is to have passive house in the program on day one. So you're programming it in, you're making design decisions and other decisions around the planning of the project with that requirement baked in like you would building codes. It's just another design constraint uh, that can really inform uh, creative design. Work with a certifier from day one. Don't go out and just think, oh yeah, we'll just do what we, normally do and, and you know, we'll slap on a few things and it'll be passive house. Uh, don't dig a hole that you have to then dig yourself out of. Start with the certifier, start with the ins in, uh, institutional knowledge and really bring that experience with you. Um, get training for the team. Of course, it's hard to grow if everybody has to have experience doing it. Uh, it's great if you can get people with experience uh, and good experience. But that training, everybody should be trained, the key elements of it. I'm happy to speak to that later. Um, and you know, stick to that certification target and, and go through. Um, so uh, a lot more to say on that. I will just say that Passive House is great because through this simple approach in a way where it's really things are distilled down you not only end up with a lot of uh, creative freedom, which we'll see in a second, but it supports all kinds of goals. So we see zero carbon as a huge policy goal, right? In Boston, and this is true in, in many places, in Boston, looking at its carbon budget, buildings take up the majority of their carbon. 
if they don't deal with buildings, they don't have a climate solution. So Passive House helps them get on that pathway. And many, many uh, jurisdictions are seeing that. It supports electrification and renewables. It's not demanding renewables and it's not de demanding net zero, but if we can really smash the energy demand, it gives flexibility. It gives flexibility to the owners of the building. It gives flexibility to the utilities in the grid. Uh, it helps optimize the overall systems and the transition that we're doing. The trick is we need to hit efficiency first and foremost. It supports health and well being, particularly during the pandemic. You know, we see indoor air quality coming way up on the radar. So we have COVID, we have allergens, we have uh, uh, indoor air pollution from leaky buildings because you're next to a highway. Uh, we have, uh, or forest fires. Um, we have bad indoor air quality due to mold propagation from poor construction. Um, Passive House works to mitigate these and provide excellent indoor air quality. Um, comfort. You start with the comfort as well as the health. You can sit by the windows in the middle of the winter and be comfortable. People think about passive house. Oh, we have thicker walls. It's going to take square footage away. Yeah, it does take a few inches away from you in terms of your, your floor plan. If you're thinking in absolute terms in that way, in a zero sum game. Design is not a zero sum game, but if we look at it that way, yes. On the other hand, you don't need to have radiators at the perimeter of the building. You don't need to sit four feet away from the window to be comfortable or, or otherwise wrap yourself in a blanket. You can be right up against that window. You can use the whole space uh, and do that. The, the, the heating and the cooling elements can be back at the core of the building. You're not overcoming crappy windows sucking the heat off of your body in winter. Resilience, security, and equity. Passive House really started, uh, grew most dramatically at around 2000 through this program called Cepheus across uh, the, uh, Europe. Uh, and we really focused on social housing as one of the key elements. And today, affordable housing is a big driver of Passive House here and around the world. Um, as well as market rate and, and different building typologies. But we see the benefits that we can bring high quality construction to everyone. That actually, uh, the, the, that the cost, and I should have said in the cost analysis, if you're optimizing, that incremental cost should not be more than 5%. Uh, if you're, if you're going over 5% more, that there are some decisions that have been uh, made poorly, something has gone off the rails, there are other things driving the cost than passive house. Um, and you need to unpack that. Um, so with that, we can bring high quality construction across the board. We can provide resilience so you can shelter in place indefinitely in the wintertime in the polar vortex. You really can stay, you know, day in and day out based on the equilibrium that the building hits in something like this. Um, security, financial security. We're seeing massive price spikes right now in energy. If you've smashed your energy use by up to 90% for heating and cooling, you're well insulated against that, those energy shocks. Um, and again, equity where uh, these, this quality of housing can, uh, can really help change health uh, and living outcomes for folks who are living on fence line communities in, in communities that have been underserved in the past. And then embodied carbon. Um, so Passive House is smashing, is really focused on the operational energy. And embodied carbon is the other part of the building emissions. This graph from Architecture 2030 shows that, you know, over uh, um, by uh, 20, um, well, ha let's say halfway across this graph, you've got the, the embodied carbon and the operational carbon kind of balancing out, right? 15 years out. And then, You've got the operational carbon 
growing. In this first, what everybody's focusing on now is these first 15 years, right? If we've got 15 years to eliminate carbon emissions or lower them as much as possible because of the, the time value of carbon, like, like a savings, saving money, the earlier you save it, the more it's worth. And so the same thing with, with carbon emissions, the more we save now, the better it is, um, the more value it has. So embodied carbon, hugely important in the beginning. And then operational typically takes over. Passive house, because it's, it's crushing operational energy use, makes embodied carbon emissions that much more important. They become completely dominant in terms of our climate goals. So with all of that, Passive House really makes us think and work differently. We have different expectations about buildings. And really briefly here, and then we'll go to the embodied carbon. Uh, typical, typical. It's a lovely house in Colorado. Uh, this is a big indoor Publix swimming pools in Exeter, UK. It's just coming online right now. A huge explosion in the UK, the Passive House. Affordable housing, net zero in Philadelphia, really beautiful, influential project by Onion Flats. Uh, amazing uh, academic building in Australia by Grimshaw Architects at Monash University. Um, could not pick that out of a lineup of passive houses for a passive house, but it is. Um, so it's, it's amazing how far it's come. This is the Belgian embassy in the Congo, uh, not a climate, uh, that you know we'd expect. We hear all about hot and humid climates. Um, yes, you have to deal with the heat and the humidity, but it's physics. Uh, and Passive House certainly does deal with that uh, well. So they can be anywhere. This also is in Sri Lanka. This is a retrofit and it's a factory. It's a garment factory. Amazing project. Um, you should definitely look it up. And here is a, a retreat in Southern Vermont. Beautiful expression, light, air. You don't have to live in a cave. Um, you can have views and, and be comfortable and efficient. So that was a long way around to get to the pH ribbon, but it's important that we wanna lay the foundation for efficiency. First, we wanna bake in all those benefits to the occupants, to the owners, um, to, our social fabric uh, to society. And, and the pH ribbon now helps extend that, that we not only wanna drive down the operational emissions through efficiency and then renewable energy, but the embodied carbon emissions and get total carbon emissions. So what's happened is it started in the Passive House with the Passive House Trust in the UK and they developed this pH ribbon there. And the pH ribbon is right here. And you can see the, the, again, the PHPP is an Excel spreadsheet and the pH, the pH ribbon is a plugin into that Excel, Excel spreadsheet. And when you click on it, you get these different areas. Uh, there's a whole bunch of functionality that helps uh, soup up the PHPP, so to speak. And then we have the embodied carbon uh, and total CO2 and, and some other data management. We're gonna focus on the embodied carbon here. And so embodied carbon, what do we mean by it? So we have a whole life carbon of a building, uh, which includes the embodied carbon, but also includes operational carbon, which is going to be from the heating, cooling and plug loads, lighting and all that. that. Um, and then beyond life, uh, which is strange contradiction in terms to me, but um, I'm, I am learning myself here and it's really about you know, what happens after the building is gone into that materials and can we uh, you know, upcycle, can we have a circular economy where, where these things are being used and, and providing further value added. Embodied carbon is, is, um, is, is tough enough and a lot of embodied carbon uh, uh, is really focused on this first set, the A1, A2, A3. Uh, so we've got the raw material supply, uh, the product, um, the transport of it, and the manufacturing of it. So all that energy that goes into making the structure, the insulation, all the products that go into building. Um, the upfront carbon then includes 
A4 and A5, which is the transport and the actual construction and installation on the job site. We then moved to the in use, where you've got maintenance of the, of the item. So uh, items that law, last longer could have a lower embodied carbon. We've got the, the repair, replacement. What's the lifetime of these? How long is your building supposed to last? Uh, the refurbishment, and then the end of life, what's happening with it, which gets pretty um, speculative, gets further more and more speculative as you move across. Um, but it allows you to think about it and grapple with it. I think this is one of the things that really, why it's happened, uh, it's growing with the past house community, because, you know, we're trying to optimize these buildings and deal with these issues and not ignore them, but acknowledge them and do what we can. And so this is a great way of extending that and, and allowing us to further um, uh, manipulate and, and try to opt optimize the, 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 all the different variables. So what the pH ribbon does is pull data into this worksheet from three primary sources. One is the EC3 database from building transparency. It's becoming an uh, industry standard of, of sorts where manufacturers are submitting all their um, data sheets to the, to the database. They're cleaning it up a bit um, and making it available. So we're pulling a lot from there, something like, I don't know, 40,000, at least 40,000 entries. Um, and we'll be updating our pH ribbon database within it from the updated EC3 probably twice a year, um, at minimum once a year so that we stay up to date. Similarly, the EPA, we're pulling the electric, uh, the, the CO2 factors from the different grids. So the US has a whole bunch of different grids, find, figure out what grid you're in and we will be looking at the emissions based on those grids for the operational um, and, and other aspects uh, as appropriate for the building. And then the end of life is coming from the EPA. Um, so with those inputs, we're then graphing outputs um, and you can see it related here, and this is looking at different variables, um, the, the A1 through A3 is the orange, and then we've got the, the A4 and A5, construction and transport, the use, the demolition. Um, and the more you can drill in, the more precise it can be. Uh, you're gonna start really with kind of some, some big round numbers and then uh, drill down. It's almost a matter of like this, as these graphs here indicate, this is starting at a very low embodied energy condition, where this is starting at a very high embodied energy condition. This one, these are never reaching that point. Um, so you can see what a uh, relative um, impact that the, this, in, these initial design decisions, these initial construction decisions are gonna make to the overall climate impact of the building. So how do we get to that point? Well, it's a rather straightforward process of, of adding materials from the PHPP, windows and glass, uh, finishes, interior, and other constructions, other material, uh, miscellaneous materials and systems like mechanical systems, PV, uh, piping, almost anything that you could imagine, and look at standard comparisons and then, and then graph it. So to walk through that, the PHPP, if you're familiar with it, um, it's dealing with the enclosure, right? So the PHPP, the benefit here is you have all these inputs of the materials and quantities in the PHPP already for the enclosure. Um, it is limited to the enclosure, but the enclosure is a huge contributor. Um, and so you can go through based with the PHPP and pick the specific materials that you're looking at or generic materials if the specific one isn't there. Um, so that gets a whole bunch out of the way. And then we're looking at windows and doors. You can pick the glass type. You can pick the framing types. Um, and as more and more information comes online, this sort of thing can get more and more granular. And then additional construction. So on the enclosure, 
the PHPP is really dealing with the thermal boundaries. So you may have layers outside of the thermal boundary, like shingles uh, or metal sheathing or whatever it might be that need to be then added. You also have interior walls. You have uh, aspects of foundations that may not be in the PHPP because it's not part of the thermal calculation um, and, and so forth. So you wanna capture all of that um, to the extent that's reasonable. And this anything else, right? So you've got a ventilation system. Well, what's that ventilation system? You've got a heat pump. What refrigerant are you using? You know, what's the leakage rates on those? Um, uh, and so forth, all the different finishes. So it really allows you to drill down within the context of the PHPP. Again, this is all in the Excel spreadsheet. And you end up with one of these monster Excel spreadsheets, right? Um, where it's, and, and like the PHPP, it's not as, as overwhelming once you drill into it a little bit. So here we can see a wall type with the different elements of the wall type, roof and different aspects going down here. So all the different materials. And now we can plug in, and a lot of the quantities are pulling or you may add in quantities for them, depending on where the input is. We may be adding in whether the percentage of F FSC certified um, products for wood, um, the, the life expectancy is that is that component going to last the life of the building or is it gonna, how many years do we expect and then it needs to be replaced? So then we'll have a replacement cost in carbon. So we wanna get that in. Uh, transport, where is this stuff coming from? Really hard to, uh, to nail down specifically, but we can make some basic assumptions and at least have a point of comparison. So is it coming from across the oceans? Is it going across the country by rail? Is it being trucked? Um, there are basic defaults. And then if you know certain things, you can, you can drill down and make it more specific. Again, depending on the granularity, there may not be a real payoff to getting so granular, but definitely um, it's there for you to, to, uh, to confront, I guess. Um, then you can run variants. So you can check, um, you can do like a whole bunch of uh, different material scenarios here on the stack and then decide, okay, I'm gonna use this substitute concrete or I'm gonna use less um, or substitute this other material or eliminate it altogether. And so you can come up with these or different systems. You can come up with different profiles of the embodied carbon output. Um, and then it gives a bit of a heat map. This thing goes, keeps going off to the right quite a bit, but it, we get a heat map here um, showing the reddish and the greater intensity where the higher levels of embodied carbon and the green are actually negative um, and carbon sequestering, which helps towards it. Uh, we also put in the lifetime of the building. You know, are you going to say it's a 60 year building, a 100 year building, 100, you know, hopefully we're building for longer. Um, the greening of the grid. So a big variable here, right, that's outside of our control, but is a reality is that the grid is going to go all renewables. The Biden administration, I think, has a plan for 2035, which sounds majorly unrealistic. Um, but could we put in 2050? You could certainly do 20. Uh, 35, um, but these will affect the outputs of, of the embodied carbon. So all of these things are, are possible. And then again, we're back to the graphs. So we've got, um, in this uh, case, uh, you see a wide variability here from quite a low embodied carbon state to quite a high embodied carbon state. And I think this is one of these things and we're just getting started. This tool was released just two months ago um, and we're, we're gonna see users uh, kind of um, uh, get a feel for it and where, where, things are, where things are making a difference and, and where they're not. Um, you can get the graphs reading out of different scenarios and again, a lot of variables and then the operational CO2 and the embodied CO2 um, numbers. Again, um, 
embodied carbon by its nature is a very rough accounting um, just in the transport alone. Um, you know, you'd like to think if there was a building supply place close by that your rock wool insulation was coming from that rock wool warehouse, but maybe it's coming from one across the continent. You don't know for sure where it's really coming from. Um, so at the end of the day, like many things, the average, the average is going to be important and we need to play to the, to the average ultimately. So that is my um, presentation, a reminder to take the, to, to, to check out our, our learning resources. And I hope you'll join us at the Passive House Network and join our programming as well. It's great to join um, you all here. And uh, I look forward to answering some questions. I'm gonna stop sharing if that's okay. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Kenan. We have a lot of questions here. We're going to try to get to as many as we can. Can you see my screen now? I can. Okay, great. Yeah, before we get to those questions as they're coming in, just real quick as a reminder, um, if you're looking to get your continuing education for this watching it on demand in the future, not right now, head over to that Thinkific platform uh, or GBCI platform or whatever show channel you might be watching this on and take that 80% uh, quiz, uh, take that quiz with an 80% passing rate, you'll be able to pick up your CUs that way. Uh, and then also for those of you watching this live here right now, again, reminder, mark certs at gutenbergcerts.com as safe, check your spam, that's where you're gonna be getting it. I see again, a lot more questions, we're gonna get to them, a huge uh, thanks. Um, again, before we get to those questions to um, all of our presenters uh, that we've had over the years, our, volunteer pre presenters, um, our board of directors, our executive director, Jose Arana, and um, all of our members, 220 members, it's amazing. And our top tier sponsors who are gonna help you achieve many of these sustainability goals, Go All Electric, Mitsubishi, Ream, uh, Build Equinox, April Air, Aware with uh, healthier indoor air quality. A huge thanks to all of them who allow us to do what we do. So um, let's get to uh, some in embodied energy questions first, and then maybe shift to some specific sure. questions, just that way we can kind of focus on the topic. And, you know, I can I appreciate I know you're going to stick around a little bit for yeah. us. So for those of you um, who do have to get going and can't stick around, um, we will have this recorded, you can check out the rest of it later. But if you've been here for the full 50 minutes, you'll be approved for your CEU. Um, but stick around here with us just for a little bit more, um, and we're going to get to some of those embodied energy questions and then jump into some more specific passive house questions. So um, so here's a really broad question, um, and so I'll just put it out there. Instead of embodied carbon, would it be more revealing to considered embodied total greenhouse gas, GHG? Um, can you... Can you put some thought into that, Ken? Yeah, I mean, it's essentially the same thing. Um, I mean, it's uh, there. It's CO2 equivalent, right? So you're taking all the different, um, which I, I guess I should have spelled out earlier. So we're using carbon as a shorthand term. Mm -hmm. um, the technical term would be a CO2 equivalent. And in that equivalent are all the greenhouse gases converted to equivalents of CO2. So. Um, so it does capture all the, the GHGs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I was, I was looking, you know, at your tool here and some of the things you were talking about. And I was a little surprised that, because if I understand like, you know, like heat pump operations and utility usage and site versus source energy, you know, to me, that almost seems more like operational energy that you're doing in your traditional it is. program. No, it is. So you're um, but, not factoring that into the embodied, or you are you know, well, the the equipment you're making. You're you're making the equipment, right? So you're 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 mining the ore. Is all that metal virgin, or is it recycled? Mm -hmm. um, what's going into the batteries? You know, then there's the shipping from the factories in Japan to the United States, um, and everything that gets it to being plugged in is the embodied carbon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so you are really, truly just looking at that sort of, you know, from cradle to right up until operations, and then after operations, 
and you're factoring that part in this part and then the operation. Well, and the embodied, like, so the embodied carbon includes the whole life of the building. Okay, so even the operations. It's, well, it's separate from the operations. If we go back, you have the slide up? Uh, I do not. You can share your screen again if you'd like. Oh, I'm still sharing my screen. That's what I'm seeing mine over mine. Oh, well, yeah, it, this is your, I, I took it. <laughs> so if we go, go back yep. to this here. So operational carbon is down here. Oh, but it's not this sharing. Is, Sorry, it's not sharing. Energy efficiency. Oh, I'm not sharing. No. Stop sharing. Sorry. Yeah. That was weird. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So the operational carbon down here mm -hmm. is within the whole life carbon of the building. This is what the, the heating and cooling and the plug loads. Mm -hmm. This is what energy efficient, this is the electricity running the heat pumps is mm -hmm. the operational carbon. The heat pump is being manufactured here. It's being, or the raw material for the heat pump is being done here. It's being transported to the factory. It's being manufactured, right. yeah. installed, it's being used now that use, it depends on what the material is, whether it's like the use of it, but you would in a heat pump have losses, gas losses, right? Of refrigerant um, in the use of that. So you would have embodied carbon there from the heat pump. You need to maintain them. You have to replace the heat pump over a number of years or possibly refurbish them and then disposing of it at the end of the life of the building. So mm -hmm. all of that, Mm -hmm. is the aspect of the heat pump um, and, mm -hmm. and other, other building components like that. But then you've got the, the energy efficiency here separate. And one thing um, from a heat pump standpoint, which I, you know, which is interesting to point out is the refrigerants, right? I mean, those yeah. can add a lot and those are being tracked not on the operational side, but on the, um, embodied carbon side but it's i'm curious just for your thoughts you know because typically you know someone's like well this is the reason why heat pumps are concerning and we should stick with furnaces but 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 if you have an air conditioner you have the same refrigerant issues right i mean how is that all getting tracked here <laughs> well I, every piece of equipment and component everything in the building is being yeah. put into the embodied carbon calculation mm -hmm. so if you have an air conditioner um it would be here Mm -hmm. You'd be selecting it and depending on what the refrigerant was, um, and you can see the assumptions then that are baked into that. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, what did I want to go to? Uh, what you've got is um, the, the um, operational CO2 added to this embodied CO2. Mm -hmm. So the pH ribbon gives you total CO2 equivalent, we should say, the total mm -hmm. greenhouse gas emissions based on CO2 equivalent yeah. um, of the building over the life of the building. Yeah. So it gives you the, a really a complete picture, which I don't know of any other tool doing that at the moment. Right. And I appreciate one of our members here um, reminding us of uh, that on drawdown refrigerants were our number one uh, problem as far as, at least when they wrote the book, you know, maybe it's changed by now, but uh, as far as, you know, easiest low hanging fruit for, um, for carbon in, in general. Um, so, hey, uh, you know, one question I have is, and I was trying to get a sense for like how much duplicative effort you needed to have here, right? And what I mean by that is we know for, um, you know, Passive House, you're tracking all of these energy efficiency features, right? And so the idea, you know, for us, it's like beating our heads against the wall to get anyone sure. to do any kind of modeling, right? Like, sure, 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 sure. God forbid you ask anyone to do energy modeling, much less passive house. It's like, oh my gosh. And so <laughs> for us, it's like, how do we make life easy? And so I'm just looking at your tool and I was like, okay, I'm getting a sense that maybe some things are imported or some things are not. And some of that makes sense because it's not part of the modeling. Is it that you're re-sort of duplicating all these items or do the tool tools connect when you're doing the modeling for operation and embodied to some extent and you don't have to put data in twice? Do you right, know? I mean, I, that's exactly right. So, yeah. um, and what it's done, so one, and that's why the, hopefully the secret to our success is that um, uh, the people who are doing Passive House are involved in pretty intensive modeling to begin right. with. And so 
And people who are doing passive house are often, not exclusively, but are often really concerned about the climate impact of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so the embodied carbon calculation is a, is a logical extension. So we're hoping that that is like an easy on-ramp and both, and as well as people concerned about embodied carbon to mm -hmm. get them to appreciate the relationship and, and with the operational emissions mm -hmm. and to get them working together. Now, mm -hmm. the PHPP comes with, when you're doing the PHPP model for Passive House, you're inputting, you're inputting all these materials, right? You're, you're, you're defining the whole enclosure of the building, which is a huge uh, amount of the building materiality. Mm -hmm. And so you've already got that. And so with the P, with the pH ribbon, you're just, you're just selecting to that material, like mm -hmm. um, the actual specification, or it could be generic. So you're not duplicating, you're just drilling down another level mm -hmm. um, of, of description of that material. Mm -hmm. And then you're adding, because in the model initially, it doesn't have anything to do, it doesn't have any materials or components that don't affect energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. You're then adding those in new. So there's right. no duplication. Um, right. It does, is it is additive. Does it show trade-offs? I mean, you know, sometimes you do have to make a trade-off of operational versus embodied, right? Like um, I'm gonna pick on oh. spray foam, right? Let's let's pick on foam, you know. They're gonna give you good resistance to heat, right? It's gonna work really well, but perhaps you have higher embodied energy than a mineral wool or a fiber right. glass. So well, let's pick on spray foam. Yeah, let's pick on spray foam. Yeah, <laughs> foam too. You know, that's, that's how I built my career, bro. Yeah, pick um, on spray foam. <laughs> yeah. um, so if we look at this yeah. screen, right? This tall one, this is spray foam. Right. That spray foam blows you out of the water. Mm -hmm. So you start out here. You can't get it back. Um, this is mineral wool. And this is timber wood. Mm -hmm. basically wood insulation, the most uh, carbon uh, sensitive that you can do. So mm -hmm. that's kind of like your the straddling. Mm -hmm. So definitely you can, you can do the trade-offs of that and then you can do the trade-offs and, and seeing the different operational scenarios. So sure. you can absolutely see those uh, differences. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, most people just tell me from an embodied energy standpoint, if you can basically eliminate concrete, you know, you're on your, you're well on your way. I mean, is that what you all are seeing here in many ways or, or what? Yeah, I mean, concrete is a low hanging fruit for yeah. sure. Concrete and steel. Yeah. Minimize concrete and steel and you've gone, you know, that is, that's like, you know, putting yeah. on your seatbelt and brushing your teeth. Yeah. You got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, other than let's say the people who want to do this because it's the right thing to do, it's getting more interest. Um, what what reward are, is, you know, as Passive House Institute, um, uh, International, sorry, uh, giving no, to, to, to uh, Institute. yeah. What, 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 is, what is the reward here? Are you getting a badge? What is the reduction target you need to hit? Or is this just more of a, hey, right now, this is an exploratory. You can get some sense of what you're doing. It's more exploratory, yeah. Okay. It's, uh, it's very much bubbled up from the community. Mm -hmm. um, the, past, the pH ribbon started in the UK, um, again, uh, and started not as an embodied carbon tool. It started mm -hmm. as a PHPP mm -hmm. enhancement tool. Um, and it came out of kind of organic conversations within the community and the needs to develop this because it it, once you thought about it, it was logical enough and possible to be able to, to do this um, sort of approach. So tell me this, you know, I mean, obviously, to me, it would seem there would be some fear in that, you know, I know there's a passive house, there's a lot of quality assurance. It's a good thing, right? We want to make sure things are done right. Um, but I would be afraid as a designer or builder that if I start putting in extra, extra data, it opens me up to more uh, people scrutinizing my project. And if I'm not getting rewarded for it, so you, is there quality assurance sets or is this sort of like a, Hey, this is you not getting submitted. You know, what do you, what do you know about that? 
in terms of the embodied carbon calculation? Yeah, like if you start I mean, pulling out that data, is it is right. I going to start scrutinizing the project more, which I know brings a fear to a lot of people. I get it. So yeah, no, I don't <laughs> think. I mean, PHI yeah. Institute feels like the efficiency hmm. is the, is what they're focused on. Right. And because we saw all those benefits that come from efficiency alone. I mean, it's just so wide ranging and so fundamental uh, in terms of what uh, it provides and, um, uh, and, and sustainability goals and mm -hmm. much further than what I just outlined simply here today. Um, they're focused on that. Mm -hmm. And the embodied carbon um, is good, but it's not gonna, I don't think it will become, maybe it will become over time a focus. Mm -hmm. um, the strength of the this approach to it is that it's transparent. You can go in and look at the models. Somebody could scrutinize it and ask questions and see, hey, where did this come from? Where's that? What about this assumption? You can, because there are an embodied, car, you think there's a lot of assumptions in energy efficiency calculations, right? Mm -hmm. um, and embodied carbon, the amount of assumptions just multiply. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah. It, is, it is a tricky thing. Yeah. Um, and there was a great question here, which we're not going to go into because um, right now, but, uh, you know, just about alternatives to concretes for, you know, slabs and floors. And so we actually had in our 2020 residential net zero energy conference, and I'm posting a link here, um, we had uh, Siggy Coco on, uh, along with Lucas Johnson from um, 475. Oh, yeah. Uh, tag teaming uh, how to get to low carbon building enclosure ideas and Siggy mm -hmm. specifically focused on the slab approach with some natural techniques. So we are seeing more of that. So I posted a link there. You can check that out on our playlist on our YouTube channel from the 2020 Residential Net Zero Energy Conference. It was a breakout session on low carbon building enclosures. Um, Ken, what about interior finishes? The question here from Heather, uh, is EC3 really the best way to go for that? Or are there op opportunities within this tool to look into it? Um, well, so, right. There are basically, so EC3 is going to be limited in terms of, of that. And what we've done is created a library of, of basic generic materials um, so that you can, by and large, uh, at least put in some default values that there's some accounting there to be done because they're, you know, it's very limited in terms of the manufacturers, what they're providing at this point. Mm -hmm. um, it's the data is just not necessarily available. And so there is a good amount of infilling data where it's not available from EC3. Um, if it's available from other sources that could be reasonably, um, mm. you know, seen as correlating mm -hmm. um, as substitutes. Mm -hmm. And so there is a rather, you know, extensive uh, library of generic. I don't know, I am not an expert, I have to admit, on embodied carbon and calculating and everything. I'm learning as we're diving into this. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm loving hearing questions like this and uh, it'll force me to go back, and dig deeper. Yeah. So let's say, you know, um, we're, we're, I'm an architect, I'm a builder, designer, developer, and I'm just, I'm just too afraid of passive house still. And I just, and there's a lot of fear, right? And we're, <clears throat> we're trying everything we can, but don't we really afraid. want what's that? Yeah. We really want to get into embodied carbon and, you know, is this tool available for folks who just haven't got into Passive House yet to just take a look at their embodied energy? Is it open? Is it available? Is there a cost? Um, yeah, I mean, the cost is minimal. It's like $235, something like, like a that. a one-time fee? Yeah, one-time okay. fee. And okay. um, uh, for the setup, the PHPP is like $200, $250, something like that. It's okay. uh, minimal you cost. You can call up your local FI consultant and they can help you, right? You can get become friends with them, right? There's a list somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go on. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, on, on our website, on yeah. Passive House Network, there are a number of different resources. And I've got um, 
I just dropped a link into the PH ribbon webpage because somebody had asked for that. Yeah. Um, the PHPP, um, probably the best thing to do is just Google it. There are a couple of places that you can get it. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's one supplier in the US for sure, which is 475, mm -hmm. um, but there may be others. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, now, in terms of if you're not doing, so this is meant for passive house people, right? That are working in the PHPP. If you're not, um, what I would say, uh, there's a great uh, Builders for Climate Action out of Canada, Chris Magwood and the Endeavor Center. Um, they've developed along with Jacob Deverick Hewson from Vermont, um, a embodied carbon tool called uh, Bean. Yeah, I want to say. yeah, and um, you know that's focused on the A1 through A3, and they just cut it off, and they're just like everything after that is speculative. We're not touching it. Um, the the pH ribbon is meant to, um, while it's speculative after A3, uh, um, you know, it's meant to say, hey, we need to grapple with this stuff. Like, think about it. What is the life? What is the lifetime of what you're putting in? Yeah. Like you want to put in longer lifetime stuff. What is yeah. what is the payoff of PV? I mean, the biggest shocker for a lot of people is when you put PV into these calculators, mm -hmm. it jumps. It's mm -hmm. not a free ride. Yeah. Yeah. Serious yeah. body sure. carbon. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and thank you for bringing up Beam. Our hope is that by this fall, we will have the Beam folks on to talk a little bit about that resource. And I just pasted a link there for everyone right. to look at that ahead of time if you want to get started. I mean, again, we have to address this issue yesterday, and, and sadly, it's still left out of a lot of programs. So uh, switching gears here, and we certainly can take some more questions on Embodied, but let's switch over just to Passive House in general. Um, so, you know, one of our members here who just became a certified Passive House consultant, you know, he's like, hey, what the heck is PHPP? I've never seen anything like this. So... <laughs> As a reminder, remind us about, um, you know, there's two passive houses. What are some of the key differences? You know, why is PHI really the way to go or when does it make more sense? I mean, just can you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I mean, what I would say is, so PHI is the um, uh, institute in Germany, um, mm -hmm. sort of the progenitor of the, of the standard and is really, uh, pushing the globalization of passive house mm -hmm. um, and in building the international community and and driving the adaptation of the standard and methodologies and technologies um, around the world. Um, the uh, you know you can do great buildings with both um, standards. So Fias, you know, came out of uh, PHI. Uh, his approach, so to speak, um, and has, you know, in many, many, many ways, virtually identical uh, approaches and, and ways of thinking about things. Um, I am not an expert on the uh, FIAS approach by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I, I know you can do, do good buildings in both uh, standards. I personally gravitate towards PHI mm -hmm. um, because it is stayed focused on the simplicity of the approach. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to th get, make things complicated and complicated and complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, building's complicated enough, right? It's always gonna be complicated, but really maintaining focus um, and finding those uh, elegant uh, adaptations and and approaches. So yeah. the PHPP is the Passive House Planning Package, is the energy model that was developed with the Passive House Institute. And I would say, you know, one of the uh, indicative things or or characteristic perhaps is, um, you know, the, as we're saying, the PHPP is completely open. You can go in and see all the calculations. It's not a black box whatsoever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it's the only energy model like that in, in working in this realm. So it gives you uh, a way to just uh, have a lot of knowledge and a, a lot of being 
being able to do these kind of variants like you're talking about. What if we change this? What if we do that? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's very good in that way. Yeah. Um, they also certify components from around the world um, and, and really have worked hard to close the loop on, on quality control. So, uh, right. Yeah. So yeah, there are, so you can actually find certified passive house products, right? Um, yes. So if you go on the PHI website, let me go here. And that's one of the things people should not be a stranger to the PHI website. Um, it is a wealth of information. So this is the database for components. Um, we go back, if you've not been on the Passpedia and you're into it, mm. it's going to make your evening. <laughs> You won't be able to stop. Um, <laughs> and just on and on and on in terms of the basic website for the right. Institute is just passivehouse.com. Yeah. Um, put that in and stuff on certification right. and, and all around. And, you know, people work in both uh, PHI and FIAS um, realms. A lot of, a lot of the bigger companies um, are doing buildings in both. They'll run the models through both systems and see what the um, optimization differences are. And yeah, on one yeah. project, it'll make sense for them to go one way. And on another project, it will make sense for them to go another way. True. Um, yeah. And so uh, it's not an either or. Um, uh, it, it really, you know, the more the merrier. We need, right. we need more solutions, not fewer. Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, the Passive House name, I have to say, perhaps maybe a bad name because oh everybody it, says it well it, it, it <laughs> and, and I want to actually focus on the second word because we've so many people saying well we can't certify multifamily or commercial it's passive house but that's not true correct <laughs> right well and I hope in those examples that we showed right um, yeah, you've got a factory yeah. an embassy yeah. you know we've got high rise in, in Boston right now which will feature at the conference right uh, a 40 story glass office building. Right. Passive house certified. Yeah. Um, things that were unimaginable. Bel Brussels, Belgium essentially mandated passive house oh, wow. as building regulation for everything new, existing retrofits, yeah. residential, commercial, institutional, across the board. Mm -hmm. um, and they did that in an amazing program called uh, Exemplary Buildings Program, which New York has um, kind of uh, mm -hmm. borrowed, shall we say, um, and, and their program called Buildings of Excellence. Mm -hmm. um, and so anything is possible. Mm -hmm. What seemed, and it, it is unfortunate, and the, the funny thing is, is that a single family home is probably the hardest thing to make a passive house. <laughs> Good. Yeah. It's true. It's, we, we the bigger buildings are much easier. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, and, and we see it out there, is from a green building standpoint, you know, there is a, um, there's an equity problem, right? A lot of people, yeah. you know, based quite frankly on their income, their background, their race, get left out of the residential green building movement and not just passive house, but all of them lead whatever yeah. they may be. Many of them don't get to benefit from this. And so the specific question here is just, you know, you know, it's really more about that and then just available resources out there to help people pay for, um, you know, passive house renovations, which are, you know, a good thing to do, but pretty aggressive in many cases, depending on what you find. Do you know if more and more are coming online, they're becoming more available or easy to use in any, any good ones you can reference? Incentives or? Yeah, I mean, incentives or any kind of mechanisms by which people can use to like banks yeah. who say, hey, yeah, we'll pay for your passive house retrofit. We won't get in your way. We'll make it easy. Like most banks, you come to them with this stuff right. and they're like, we're going to roadblock you because first of all, our appraisers don't get it. You know, <laughs> all right. Not that they're trying to do it. It's just nobody understands it. So, yeah. right. so 
The big thing is, I would say uh, two things. One, well, just straight up incentives. So the, the best structured incentives in the US right now are Massachusetts um, through MassSave. They're sure. really straightforward and, um, you know, you still have to jump through hoops, but it's as straightforward as they come. New York has a lot of incentives, but there are more, um, a lot more hoops, mm -hmm. um, a lot more convoluted. The most dramatic and single family oriented is the mm -hmm. in Colorado for the Marshall Fire, um, mm -hmm. where there were uh, a thousand single family homes that burned to the ground. And uh, XL Energy is offering uh, $37,500 for a certified passive house mm -hmm. um, incentive. So there's a big carrot there, but again, you know, we'll see what happens with that because as you said, there's a fear factor going in. Um, mm -hmm. the, um, the big part though is with the finance and we are seeing, it's, it tends to be on less in the single family. It's more in the multifamily affordable housing and all sure. of that. But what we see with the finance is mm -hmm. that you know, the money people don't care, right? They just about making money and minimizing risk. And like, and so if you can make the pro forma work, if you can have, um, uh, if you can make it work. So I just, I just saw the, the this, um, I'll let me, I'll circle back around and comment. Um, if, if you can make it work, uh, optimizing, the cost of the project, then you can get the money and you can finance it. Um, you know, it's, it's just another construction project. The biggest thing, the most straightforward and brilliant and obvious thing to, to making it work is that rather than building the typical American home that's a bit oversized, mm -hmm. um, is building a smaller home. Mm -hmm. And now I know if you're building a small home to begin with, building a smaller home may not be uh, uh, necessarily applicable, mm -hmm. but we need to look at these other variables that drive cost. Mm -hmm. And we can tweak these other variables and get quality and maintain the cost level. Now, mm -hmm. construction in general is really expensive um, mm -hmm. and unaffordable. And there's a lot of things beyond passive house. Again, that's a right. huge problem. I see the, the one um, remark by Imani on low income people not having enough taxes to qualify for incentives and the redlining, huge issues. Um, the, the, uh, yeah, definitely tax incentives are minimal at best. Um, mm -hmm. The incentives that make any sense are just direct cash mm -hmm. gifts, essentially, um, that are above and beyond, uh, that are, they're all essentially utility based. They're not coming from, from the tax angle. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, switching to some, you know, um, the, the, the emissions here before we wrap up again, um, you know, outside of operational. And there was, a, you know, kind of a question here, but, you know, we know like a lot of the green building programs that make them holistic is this one called place, the, the, what we call the sense of place. And you know, that's, you know, in green building programs and passive house, it's, you know, it's not a part of it that I can tell, but, you know, and a lot of that boils down to like in lead, you're looking at bus lines, you're looking at walkability, you're looking at local parks. In the old days, they were a bit of the butt of a joke where you would throw in a bike rack and you were lead certified, but it was in a, you know, dark alley somewhere where the bike would get stolen and it would get destroyed by the weather, right? So it was kind of always a joke, right? Or those alternative parking signs, it was, it was a joke, but it's real stuff. I mean, if you're talking about a project, you're talking about, hey, is this near a park? Can people get here? Is this near a bus line? We don't drive. And right. that reduces energy as well. Do you know if that's ever being planned to kind of get factored into these embodied energy, just thinking about where the house is and how people can avoid transportation, even if it's electric, that still uses a lot right. of energy. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think the big approach, the philosophical approach with passive house is that there's a lot of important sustainability issues out there and there's a lot of complementary issues and, and uh, things that we need to do. Um, for passive house, it's really important to nail the fundamentals of the building performance. Mm -hmm. 
and keep our eyes on the ball with that. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say, and one of the strengths of passive house, so we we want to invert that critique in a way um, mm -hmm. and say it's a strength that it's so focused and it's a strength that it doesn't demand all these other things uh, because mm -hmm. You have this fundamental level of performance. Now it can go in the service of these other things. What are your sustainable priorities? Um, and certainly there's a lot of alignment, right? So people uh, in passive house are tend to be more urbanists, um, you know, are going to care about the bike lanes, are going to care about uh, green energy, are going to care about um, social equity, are going to care about um, all of the all of these elements of, of, of sustainable um, uh, sustainable communities. And that's one of the things we want to do at the conference in Boston is mm -hmm. you know with these buckets of efficiency, electrification is super important. Electrification isn't required by past us. it's encouraged. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got um, embodied carbon and equity. And equity really wraps it all up. I mean, equity cuts across everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's really important from a passive house perspective um, that these fundamentals are uh, benefiting everybody. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of further, you know, education, awareness, and training, you, you do a, 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 a U.S. conference every year. Or does that move around the world? The passive house conference. Yeah. So uh, uh, the Pass House Network has a national conference okay. in different places around the U.S. Okay. It's been in New York. It was in New York last year. It'll be in Boston. It's been in Pittsburgh. It's been in San Francisco and Oakland um, sure. and, and so forth. The international conference um, has been largely uh, um, held in, Ger in either Austria or Germany oh, okay. um, just because of critical mass essentially in proximity to the Institute. Sure. Uh, but they are looking to go global with that. And then what they do is they partner with the regional. So we have our conference in Boston, several people will come over from the Institute um, right. and participate in the conference. Sure. They had an international conference in China uh, before the pandemic. Um, Canada has a national conference every year um, so there's a lot of ways to plug in with that. Yeah. And, you know, for those who maybe, you know, can't make it to the conference, maybe at this point, I don't blame you, you know, don't want to go into an in-person conference, want to get online education training. Is that something Passive House Network can help with? Are there Absolutely. that are available? Um, it's what we've been all about on okay. the, uh, let me give you this link here. This is kind of the top of the tree in the education yeah. overview. Um, and so we've got those introductory courses. We've got the core CPHD specialized courses um, and a lot of content online as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, great, Ken. Um, you know, I really appreciate you coming back on again. I second or yeah, yeah. time on our show. Uh, under a different Pleasure. Avatar, but it's good to <laughs> good to see out there and good to have you back and hopefully we can catch up in the real world but um again thank you so much uh ken levinson uh passivehousenetwork.org go check it out to learn more and uh take care everyone have a good week and thank yeah. you thank you brett thank you everybody have a great day yeah bye bye-bye be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.